It's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, three colleagues from Auckland Museum that I'm surrounded by here. We've got uh, Gareth De Walters, who is the um, Digital Content Production Manager at the museum. Uh, and then Rebecca Loud here is the pictorial librarian, and Zoe Richardson is the assistant librarian at the museum as well. And I'm really delighted to um, have this session because uh, Gareth uh, was telling me, and I believe that the, um, this collection-led social media game, one thread that they're going to talk about, uh, kind of grew out, it got its impetus from um, a presentation that Chris McDowell, that those of you who went to the NDF, I think two years ago, or one year, 2013, 2013 uh, Chris gave this really great presentation about um, linked data and connect, uh, con uh, connections across collections. Um, and it was great to see uh, that kind of spur on some um, ideas with the Auckland Museum folk and this, uh, this social media game emerged from that, uh, from that talk. So it's really great to see um, uh, those, those connections coming from, from NDF presentations. So uh, please join me in welcoming um, them to present. Uh. Thanks everyone. Um, welcome, welcome along. So we're going to talk about the social media game that uh, we kicked off in February of this year called OneThread. Um, the idea behind today's talk is that it's kind of, we'll be taking you behind the scenes and kind of a little bit looking back on, on the project, some of the things we learned and perhaps providing a, a few hints to anyone who's considering starting their own similar sort of project. So we'll be covering things like um, uh, where we found inspiration for the project, why we started the project and what we hope to achieve, the brains behind the project, um, who we worked with at other the museums, um, how we establish those relations, establish and maintain those relationships. We'll cover off a few um, tips on um, the tools we used and developing and encouraging your player community. Um, so we'll move right on. So yeah, for, for any of the latecomers here, um, just again, just sort of kind of calling out this uh, this wonderful image that my colleagues here found. And you'll recognize that gentleman there in the, in the front there is uh, US President Richard Nixon in a tractor somewhere in New Zealand. It's like White Pokoro or something. Yeah, from the Auckland Star. So I'm just going to kick that off. OK, so first of all, I thought we'd just um, talk about why there's, why there's three of us up here. Um, we, we found to run a successful collections-led social media project, we really needed to bring together the skills of collections and um, digital staff, digital uh, and collection subject matter experts. Because um, as we later learned as we went through the project, um, some of our partner organisations did encounter difficulty pairing up collections and uh, digital colleagues, and that, that sometimes affected their ability to gather the content <coughs> for games. Um, so if you're planning your own similar project, it's well worth your time uh, upfront connecting those collections and digital stuff as soon as possible. So, um, kind of already been over this, but yeah, my name's Gareth, I'm the Digital Content Production Manager at Auckland Museum. And I'm Zoe Richardson, and I'm responsible for internal and external image supply across all museum collections. And I'm Rebecca, and I'm the pictorial librarian, so I look after the museum's painting and photography collections. Okay, so what, it, what is OneThread? So OneThread is a game that we created to increase awareness of and interest in collections held across New Zealand galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. It's very much a collaboration between the contributing um, organisations, um, and this collaboration within, within the sector was, was um, key to its success. Um, it allowed us to showcase the relatedness of collections that was held across all the, uh, all the contributors. Um, and each game worked more or less like this. It was based on a common theme that was set by Auckland Museum or set in collaboration with the contributors. Um, and all the contributing glams would post images of collection items to their Twitter accounts, um, sometimes with cryptic clues for the for the um, for the public to then guess what the common thread was. So so players would, would kind of follow the clues across accounts. Um, games ran between Wednesday and Friday, and our Twitter followers would then DM us with the guesses of what they thought linked linked the clues together. Um, as we moved through the week the clues got progressively easier, so we're kind of encouraging people to, to do well at the game. Um, and at the end of each game, we'd announce, announce the answer, announce the winners, and add those winners to a leaderboard. Um, we had a, a range of glams um, playing with us uh, during the run of one thread, and so we'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the support of Te Papa, Nelson Provincial Museum, Waikato Museum, in helping us uh, get one thread off the ground. Uh, we thought the best way to understand the game was to play it. Um, so throughout, throughout this presentation, uh, we're going to be posting clues, and uh, at the end you'll get the chance to guess uh, what the common thread is. 
and we'll also be posting on uh, Twitter as well, so you can follow through the uh, the feed. And we do have prizes at the end as well. So it's chocolate for people who can guess what the, the thread is. Um, so this is your first clue. Um, it's a book titled An Account of the Manners and Customs of Modern Egyptians and it was written by Edward William Lane and published in 1842 and it comes from Auckland Museum's Library's Rare Book Collection. Okay, so what was the um, inspiration for One Thread? Um, as we heard in the intro, it was a, the inspiration came from a talk that Chris McDowell gave at um, NDF 2013 on linked open data. Um, in his talk, Chris talked about the challenges and practicalities of searching common collections across New Zealand glams. And in, Chris, uh, in Chris's talk, he focused on Colin McCann as, an, as a way of um, uh, tracking across collections to um, search for, for those, those sort of common collections. Um, and what, what this kind of got me thinking about um, how our own overlapping, in, um, overlapping interests with other um, New Zealand memory institutions, um, how those panned out, and could we create our own kind of lightweight social media game to help showcase these collections? So, so to put that in a, a bit of context, it was context we were at the time that this game kicked off. We were in between um, collection uh, collections online systems. Um, we had an old one that was up and running, and. Um, and it was soon to be re uh, replaced by, by a new version. So it was good for us, um, and the game is also kind of very useful for perhaps smaller institutions who don't have their own huge um, collections online database. So why would we do this? Um, warning, there's going to be buzzwords. Um, in alignment with our content and engagement strategy and Future Museum, which is the Auckland Museum strategic document for the next 20 years, we aimed to provide a game that, w um, that provided real engagement with our um, audience. So that's not, that sort of sits aside, uh, sits alongside our sponsored posts and sort of general likes and favourites. And we just, um, yeah, so we were looking for a sort of real engagement with our collections. And if you have a look on the left, that's um, an image that was tweeted by one of our players. Um, it's a student at the Stout Centre who printed out all the clues of our first game. Um, and we love it because it's like him in his in natural environment engaging fully with museum collections. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thesis writing was put on hold that day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so... <ooh. clears throat> Oh yes, so moving on to building the community. So the, the first step in this project was putting together a community of contributors. Um, we found it most useful to, the most useful places to hunt for contributors was um, here on that NDF network, um, the Emerging Museum Professionals page on Facebook, um, and even simply direct messaging um, account coordinators at the, at the organisation, um, at, the, at the GLAM accounts. Um, and these, so we found these are great places to start um, to start looking if you're planning your own social media project and I think like us um, you'd find that your network quickly expands as signed up contributors uh, put the word out amongst other digital colleagues. Um, by the start of the first game we had four regular contributors and, a, and then um, over time a wider cast of GLAMs who joined in as it suited their own uh, publishing schedules. Um, so once, once you've gathered together your interest, interested contributors, um, you have to make sure there's a clear understanding amongst everybody about how the game works. So uh, we managed that by putting together a content plan that um, right from the outset that, really, that clearly set out how the game worked and how the production cycle would operate. And initially it was a little bit of, little bit of back and forth to develop that content plan and iron out the game format and identify each participating um, organisation's collection strengths to make sure we were working with each other. Um, and so, but once that content plan was finalised, it, it formed a really valuable re um, reference document for new and existing contributors. Um, managing the communication between four or more institutions can be really challenging. Um, we mostly relied on email, but we kind of acknowledged that these threads could get really long, really unwieldy, and it's a bit of a burden on infrequent players. So um, I think in future we'd, sit, we'd make better use of um, free and reliable messaging platforms, things like Slack, um, uh, make more use of project management tools like Trello, which we'll come to shortly. So here's your clue number two. Sorry. Well, 
Here's your clue number two, everyone. Uh, this is a souvenir flag from our history collection um, featuring Her Majesty Queen Victoria and listing her colonies. It is made of printed cotton and accessioned into the collection into, in 1999. Absorb it. <laughs> okay, so how did we come up with the ideas for each of the games? Um, well, this kind of changed over time. So originally we uh, selected things based around current events or celebration days. Um, the first game we played was during the week of the 14th of February, so of course the common thread was Valentine's Day. Um, and we also did a Sri Lanka versus New Zealand game to tie in with the Cricket World Cup. And <coughs> um, we thought our, our players would cotton onto it pretty quickly, um, so we started to think more broadly about how we could theme our games. Um, and this has led us to more general themes, um, such as important years in history, famous people and that kind of thing. And we also had to be conscious of what we had in our collection, but also what other contributors had in their collections. Um, so ideas like theme in a game around Sir Edmund Hillary would have been really great for us, um, but probably wouldn't have worked for a lot of the contributors that we were working with. Um, so we started to think more broadly around that theme, so how could we tie in Edmund Hillary with, with a, yeah, a, a bigger theme? So that's how we decided on 1953, um, which is the year that Hillary climbed Everest. Um, and to say on a theme largely involved three of us meeting up for brainstorming sessions and um, the ideas sort of came through, you know, watching TV, at work, all sorts of places as well. Um, so clue selection. For me this is the really fun bit. Um, once we had a theme, we'd sort of have a general research, jot down some general ideas around the theme, and then we would go to Vernon and Presto, which are our two collection um, management databases. Um, when, and we spend some time sort of selecting um, clues. And um, we tried to think as broadly and as sort of laterally as possible around selecting the clues and we often use the cryptic clue, the associated cryptic clue, um, to sort of steer a collection item towards the theme. Um, we also tried from our end to tr uh, include a wide variety of collecting areas in the theme, so included natural sciences and human history. Um, objects alongside documentary heritage um, collections. Um, Rebecca and I are in a really privileged position with regards to sort of unrestricted digital access, asset, access to all of the museum's collections um, and I think that's really key alongside a really good broad um, collection um, knowledge you need sort of access to the collections and um, that collection literacy is really key in this kind of game. Yep. Okay, so this little lady is your clue number three. Um, she is a Pitt Island shag from our land vertebrates collection. Uh, her scientific name is Stictocarbo Featherstoney and she was collected from the Chatham's Ecological Region and District. Okay, so the other side of uh, building a community of contributors, of course, building a community of players. And this is where you'll need to put in your most, most of your effort. Um, so I'll just kind of quickly cover some of the tactics that we use to encourage our players to keep, keep on tuning in. Um, it was important that, to provide feedback, um, so you really want to devote time to responding to guesses and guiding players onto the solution. Um, it's important to stick to a pu uh, predictable publishing schedule so that players know when, when it's time for a new game, when one ends. Um, provide a how to, how to play primer um, to help build the audience. Um, and promote these primers um, frequently. You'll find that these uh, those will be useful to your contributors too, and that they'll start um, promoting it independently. Um, respond to player suggestions. Um, they'll quickly tell you if gameplay can be made better, and then write these changes back into your content plan. Um, report, excuse me. Record player progress through the game. Um, as we touched on, one th we created a one-thread leaderboard, so it helps. Um, create a little bit of competition between players, um, but it's also a little bit of a, a platform for, um, that you can base a reward system on, which is the next point. So it's important to reward your players. Um, and there's many ways you can do this, from uh, free tickets to behind the scenes tours, which is what happened over this side. Um, one of the, the leaders of the board, um, we took on a um, behind the scenes tours down to the, the basement, basement two. She really loved that. Um, so. Um, the other side of it is we found one thread worked um, best when there was a community of memory institutions working together. Um, players really enjoyed following clues across collections and participating in the, connect in the exchanges between the glands. 
So, here's your clue number four. This odd little, little nugget is your clue number four. It's a sealed end of a telecommunications cable that stretched from Bamfield Creek, Vancouver Island, to Fanning Island. The cable was completed in 1901. Behold the majesty of the Trello. Um, for people who don't know about Trello, it's a free project management and workflow platform that can be adapted to almost any task. And we used it um, really successfully to collaborate both internally and externally with other contributors. Um, we loved that it was really visual and you could um, allow us to see um, all of our contributors' content um, uploaded before it was published. It has an inbuilt messaging and notification functionality, which we use to sort of prompt uh, our fellow contributors and uh, help us plan and play the game. It's really easy to use, uh, intuitive, and um, we use it as a place for our potential um, uh, future games to be sort of socialised and, and shared there. As well. Yeah, so just to highlight that, I think. As Zoe says, it's a really <laughs> flexible system, and we found that people, um, the con other contributors picked it up really fast, so we didn't really have to guide people through it. Um, so, continuing on the planning and publishing theme, and, um, and coordinating our own game, we'll just kind of uh, take a, a deeper look at how a clue moves through the, uh, the production cycle. So yeah, and so here's a here's a snapshot of that clue workflow. On the left, you can see that there's the Trello card. We collaboratively create the clues. Um, Trello is very flexible. Um, it allows you to add, add a number of details that are useful um, to the contributors, like details of the clue itself, um, due dates, production status checklists, um, image attachments, links to collection databases. All this information is incredibly useful for contributors who are spread right across the country. Um, and streamlines that whole process of organising and publishing a game. So when we're in the middle of playing a game, um, contributors can reference back to this and see how the, how the whole game is going to play out and influence how they, they post their own clues. Um, why did we select Twitter? Um, we found Twitter was a really good fit for a responsive, quick-paced game like this. Um, by contrast, we find that uh, Facebook or Instagram can be, in some ways be reasonably closed environments and some, and don't lend themselves well to that kind of uh, fast-paced participatory gameplay. Um, uh, kind of want to stress the importance, um, as came up in um, Adrian and Amanda's talk earlier on, about the importance of um, using anal analytics. So Twitter offers a really good free analytics package that helps you monitor the success, the success of your posts. Um, so it's really easy to see which ones are performing best with your, with your players and then use those insights to guide your future game selection. So here's clue number five and it's a snazzy pair of shoes from our Applied Arts Collection. Um, they are from Clarks in England in a navy and white and they have a Cuban heel. Mm. Okay, so I'm just going to fill you in on why it was really beneficial to be involved um, from a collections point of view. Um, I got involved because it was a really great opportunity to highlight the collection um, and some of these items might not have surfaced in exhibitions or in publications um, so it was a really great chance to share with other people what we had. Um, we particularly love using quirky, odd, um, obscure items and objects that people might not expect that we have. Um, so on the right here you can see this is a cast lead icon, um, lead icon. Um, which we use in our fakes and hoaxes game and it's one of the um, infamous Shadwell forgeries um, made by a pair called Billy and Charlie in England um, during the middle of the 19th century. Um, we also hope to get people thinking differently about our collection. Um, so on the left we have a um, Fox Talbot salt print uh, which we used in one of our games um, where the clue um, and the answer was salt. So, um, and aside from promoting the collection it was also really great to participate in OneThread because it helped build knowledge of the collection. Um, and it was really fun to be involved with and provide an opportunity to work with my co not only my colleagues but also my peers in other institutions as well. Um, so turning to the, the benefits from a web and digital perspective, um, one of our objects was to change the relationship between us and our visitors on social media. So away from passive likes and more towards more genuine engagement with collections. Um, and Twitter really allowed us to do this. 
the platform is, it was a good fit for the project. It was lightweight and it's a responsive medium and it suits these quick paced games and threaded conversations with contributors and players. Um, you can directly ask your players how good, how good the game, how well the game is going and ask what might be improved, allowing you to respond quickly and refine the game. Um, your players can create derivative works and sub-games. Um, you, you can see on this slide, um, there are instances within games where players spontaneously posted their, their working, um, showing how they derived their own solutions. Um, and so the hashtag show your working became a thing. And, and it kind of um, worked into another way of, of rewarding players and encouraging them on. Um, the players' answers might be delightfully incorrect or identify co uh, connections that we never intended. But either way, it formed a pool of ideas that um, informed future game selection. Um, and we found banding together as a network helped promote the game locally and even raised our um, profile internationally with key influencers like Mia Ridge and Mar Dixon. And, and of course, it improved, our, improved the reach. We began to see these, um, as you can see, these uh, <coughs> stats from Twitter Analytics. You can see these nice little peaks um, that align with the, with the, the one thread gameplay on, um, with reach going up on from Wednesday to Friday. So here's your final clue. Um, this photo was taken by Arthur Ninnis Brecken, and it features Vivian Walsh after he made several successful flights in Papakura during April of 1911. Okay, so we'll just wrap up with uh, a few of the lessons learned. Um, Emphasising again the importance to monitor, refine, rinse and repeat. Um, Twitter offers this really good free analytics package which helps monitor the success of your posts. So you see which ones perform best with your visitors and use those insights for future game selection. We found a lot of value in publishing as a network rather than going it alone. Players enjoy this interplay between glands. And, and we took our collections into new geographic territories. So usually our reach just stuck with Auckland. It was going right throughout the country. And that was the same for smaller institutions as well. We'd retweet their, their content. Um, and expect drop-offs. That's OK. Contributors and players will come and go. But you need to consider how long can your project survive without contributors, without the other contributors, um, and write this contingency into your content plan. Okay, we also learnt to create reasonable publishing schedules. So one of the things that we could have improved on was planning our games further in advance um, and setting the frequency at which we played the games more realistically. So every three weeks might have worked better for us than every <coughs> week. Um, also plan your exit strategy. So ideally we would have liked the game to have continued till the end of the year. Um, but that was perhaps a bit ambitious as contributors dropped off or we weren't able to de dedicate as much resource to create the games. Um, which leads on to our next point which was devote resources to the game. Um, while Twitter is a quick publishing platform, it still required a fair amount of team effort and staff time to plan each of the games and find and create content. Um, and providing help for the players. So Gareth created a web page on the Auckland Museum website which um, we used to have full instructions for the game and the leaderboard and that was a great touchstone for people to refer back to to get full instructions rather than tw uh, tweeting it out every time. Be flexible, um, so we were really responsive to player feedback and we modified and altered the game as we went along to sort of meet feed uh, the players' needs and this opened the door for a lot of future collaborations. So we've got the network of our fellow glands and all of the content is still active and accessible so it can be used again. Um, so as we wrap up, has anyone guessed the one thread? Oh we've got one, what is it? No. <laughs> I'll go through them again. Manners and customs of the modern Egyptians, oh. Queen Victoria, Stichicabo <laughs> Feather Stony. Oh, oh we've got one. Yeah. Ding ding ding. Anyone else get that? Yeah. Just then? <laughs> <laughs> so it's the streets of central Wellington. So some of you native Wellingtonians might have got that one. There is chocolate for those. Okay. Great. Well thank Yeah, go on. Thanks for listening everyone. And yeah. any questions? <laughs> What's next? <laughs> so the question was, what's next for the um, benefit of the video? 
What's next? Um, that's a tough one. Um, no, no plans for um, anything immediate right now. We're just, we'll probably take a break from this, um, take some of the lessons learned, and then yeah, start forming our next project. But we can keep you keep you updated if you're, if you're interested in collaborating. How how is your team formed? Did it happen organically, or did you set out to pick people? So I sort of supply images to Gareth on a daily basis for digital content um, and he sort of knew that I was willing and able to and had access to all of the collections so it was an easy an easy fit um, and then Rebecca sits two doors down like two desks down from me so pushed my way in pushed away in <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a good fit yeah, yeah. it's sort of it, organically yeah I, I, yeah it started organically but like I was saying that that um, that connection between collections and digital stuff was was, was vital. I, I couldn't have pulled it off on my own. Um, needed that that collections expertise. For management, okay, like, was it hard to convince them that this is something that you should be spending your time on? I'm just going to repeat <laughs> the question again. That's a question around: Did management take a bit of uh, um, convincing to spend your time on the game? Um, not at all. No, the, um, everyone was very supportive. Um, but we did tie it back with with the, the future museum and our public engagement strategy. So uh, we, we tied that in, um, uh, made that explicit in the content plan. So yeah. we weren't going rogue. <laughs> I think some of our contributors did raise questions about their management. We're asking them what was you know the point of the game and what they were getting from it, though. So it was probably an issue for other oh, okay. yeah contributors. But yeah, in some ways it was a bit of a pilot to see how we could improve that, that nature of engagement and move beyond those, those likes and favourites, so in that way it's really successful. Yeah. Thank you for that fantastic approach towards engagement. You mentioned that you were moving from just the likes model to a general engagement. Yeah. How did you actually measure the engagement? <laughs> so it's just a quick question about measuring engagement. Sorry, I'd have to repeat just for the video. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> that's, that's the really tough side, getting that, that qualitative side down measuring that so um, um, it, it was kind of lightweight so we'd, we'd um, be asking them kind of doing informal surveys within within Twitter getting um, feedback and response and, and changing the games as we went along um, but if we um, did, a, did a similar game um, a new project I think we'd, we'd work those quali be more explicit about those qualitative measures and the content plan yeah and I think we had one question on it So that was a question of how was it promoted to begin with? Um, I think that was one of the benefits of banding together. Um, so if we if we publish it, if we're kind of broadcasting from one organisation, then we're kind of we're we're, um, we're broadcasting to an existing audience, and we found it really took off when it was four of us or more of us working together. And um, yeah, as I say, they they really enjoyed that that interplay, and and people could. Yeah, we got a, we broke down that broadcast model so people were talking directly to the, the glams and we made it really informal. So it was it was self promoting in a way, and and some of those um, those international influences kind of picked it up and that, that helped promote it as well. Anybody else? Someone down the back there. So how many how many entries? Yeah, so how many entries per one thread? It varied. It really varied. So sometimes if we would. We've actually just played a game on our own where we didn't collaborate with other people, but um, <laughs> we were doing sort of like six or six or eight. But then sometimes we, you know, we did like all the lyrics of a few of my favourite things from Sound of Music, and that was sort of thirty entries, yeah. and they'd get progressively easier. So, and another difficulty in terms of measurement, like we got a sense, kind of anecdotally, that there was this big lurking audience. Um, we knew internally, we, we saw people kind of posting photos of them playing, of themselves playing, but they weren't actually sending us the DM. So it was a cha challenge both to kind of make feel, people feel comfortable and convert them and make sure they could send in their guesses. But yeah, that lurking audience, really hard to measure. We also had a lot of internal, uh, like our Auckland Museum staff playing, which was really good because we could get feedback at lunchtime over it. So it was, yeah, get your staff involved. And thank you, Bonnie, for playing. Too. Yeah, Bonnie in the audience. Whoop. <laughs> 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 what do you think you could have done better? Um, I mean, so what do you think you could have done better? I think the big one was changing the publishing schedule to 
um, nice kind of discrete three-week blocks. So then the contributors know what they're signing up for. I think it initially felt, felt a bit kind of endless and nameless for contributors, and so it felt a bit too much and some might have backed away, but you could kind of take it in those three-week blocks, rest it for a while, then come back, and it, then it's more manageable. Anybody else? We've got a couple more minutes before we go and have a cup of afternoon tea. Yeah, one, sorry. Yeah, one more here. So what is the basic approach to have the game figured out first on the theme and then look up the collections or it was the other way around. We had the collections which people wanted to showcase and you created a thing around it. Yeah, so just a quick question around what came first, the collections or the game? Which, or Yeah. Sometimes both. So yeah, like when we started off with Edmund Hillary, that started off because we have a great collection of his yeah, archive. archive or, yeah. And so we thought, oh, we could use that. And then, but we then had to think, well, that might restrict people. So we had to think about another theme. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time I think the themes came first and then we would like look to see if we could actually fit stuff in. And that's thing. where it was easier for us because we've got a huge collection compared to other people. So. Um, An encyclopedic <laughs> Not to like, <laughs> but like, I'll, 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 yeah, so that was easier for us, so that's why but, we had to, um, we had to help. But to mitigate that, ones. that's why we're very keen for the smaller um, contributors to <laughs> to be very, act, very active in, in, um, in nominating some themes, so then we, we already knew that it would work well with their collection. Anybody else? Thanks so much, guys, for a really fantastic yeah. presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.